Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another Hanu and the Kaiser podcast, or Hanu and the Kaiser's podcast. I can't remember what I named it now. <laughs> and I'm, of course, Hanu, and joining me again for another spooky Edgar Allan Poe thingamajigger, it's Retro Kaiser. Yep, your favorite Australian asshole that supplies the best sound effects in town. Yes. All right, so... In case, if you are tuning in and didn't listen to the very first podcast, uh, and you don't know what this whole thing of a jig is about, let me explain it to you. So, in this uh, podcast, which is sort of a podcast, it's only on YouTube though, uh, I read an Edgar Allan Poe story, and Kaiser reacts slash makes sound effects like he said last time. The last time we read The Telltale Heart, which is kind of a uh, super classic, iconic uh, Edgar Allan Poe story. Uh, and the reason we're doing this, of course, is that, number one, I'm a huge Edgar Allan uh, Poe fan. He's my favorite author, and I love his short stories. And Poe, and uh, Poe, sorry, not Poe, Kaiser. <laughs> Kaiser uh, really likes uh, the Edgar Allan Poe stories, but he hasn't actually ha managed to read too many of them. So this is, so as much as this is for your entertainment, this is for Kaiser's educational benefit, if you will. <laughs> It saves me time reading. So think of it as um, him reading me a lullaby before I go to bed. Lullaby. <laughs> reading a lullaby. <laughs> you mean sing, singing a lullaby. Telling you a bedtime story. Yeah. yeah yes. Yes. And today's... The goth emo bastard that I am, I like the Poe stuff. Yeah. All right. And that, that's understandable. I've read Poe before bedtime as well. Okay. But today's podcast is going to be a little bit special because we are not doing just one Poe story. We are doing... Two. And the two stories that we are going to be reading today, one of them a super, super short story, uh, and both actually stories I read um, when I was in high school, when I talked about last time how I got into Edgar Allan Poe, like really, really got b big into Edgar Allan Poe in high school. And both of these stories are stories that I read in high school, and this has set me down the path to becoming the huge Edgar Allan Poe fanboy that I am. Uh, so the first story we're going to read today is the Oval Portrait, and the second story, and I need to get this out of the way before we get to it, is Berenice, not Benerice, like I said in the last podcast, like multiple times. <laughs> and or I, have as I kept on read, or as I kept on saying when I read it, Bernice. Bernice. <laughs> well, uh, well, I, I have a funny story about the title of that. Um, and actually, that's a story I had to read, read, we had to read for class, actually. So that wasn't one that I, uh, most of the post stories that I read in high school, I read, you know, just out of, uh, I, I had to read them for, like, classes, but I got to choose them. But Berenice is special because um, we, we actually read that in class when we were talking about gothic horror. So, but yeah, I, I still, it, it, but I still really, really enjoyed it. But... I have a funny story about that. I'll tell that after I've read the Oval Portrait because we have to get we have to get this podcast started with the first story and the Oval Portrait. Like I said, really really short story where uh, it's only it's like uh, three three full pages and then a little bit of a fourth page in this little uh, physical poll collection that I have. Uh, and if this was in a full A4 size paper, it would probably like fit on both sides of that paper easily. So. But like what we mentioned before, uh, Poe, what, what, what makes Poe so fun to read, even though he, his stories are really, really old, is like he's a master of the scene. And even like some of the Poe stories that necessarily don't have like a very intricate narrative, they usually have like very, uh, this sounds funny, but like stunning visuals. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, they paint a very, very vivid picture, uh, wouldn't mm -hmm. you say, based on the previous story that we read? Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay, keeping it short and sweet today. All right, but let's get on with the Oval Portrait. All right. It's going to be interesting. This is one of the ones I'm unfamiliar with, so I don't know how to make the sound effects for this one. But uh, we'll just go as we go, I guess. Okay, let's, let's now start. Okay. The chateau into which my valet had ventured to make a forcible entrance rather than permit me in my desperately wounded condition to pass a night in the open air was one of those piles of commingled gloom and grandeur, grandeur uh, which have so long frowned among the Apennines, not less in fact than in the fancy of Mrs. Ratcliffe. There's a lot of exposition in this first uh, part. Sorry about that. 
Okay. To all appearance it had been temporarily and very lately abandoned. We established ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuously furnished apartments. It lay in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry, and bedecked with manifold and multiform armorial trophies, together with an unusually great number of very spirited modern paintings in frames of rich golden arabesque. Modern in this sense is the early 1800s, by the way. <clears throat> <laughs> so they're, in, from our perspective, still pretty old. In these paintings, which depended from the walls, not only in their main surfaces, but in very many nooks, uh, which the bizarre architecture of the chateau rendered necessary, in these paintings, my incipient delirium, perhaps, had caused me to take deep interest, so that I bade Pedro to close the heavy shutters of the room, since it was already night. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> that was the closing of heavy shutters. It wasn't, it didn't sound very heavy. It sounded like you were, it sounded more like a zipper. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also funny. Okay. To light the tongues of a tall candelabrum. Uh, which stood by the head of my bed, and to throw open far and wide the fringe, fringed curtains of black velvet which enveloped the bed itself. <clears throat> I wished all this done that I might resign myself, if not to sleep, at least alternately to the contemplation of these pictures and the perusal of a small volume which had been found upon the pillow and which purported to criticize and describe them. This painting is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so <Sorry>, says you. <laughs> yeah. Long, long I read, and devoutly, devoutly I gazed. Uh, rapidly and gloriously the hours flew by, and the deep midnight came. The position of the candelabrum displeased me, and outreaching my hand with difficulty. What? No sound effect? <laughs> I'm trying to think of. I'm trying to think. Hey, give me a high five. But I don't think that's the. <laughs> Is that oh. difficulty reaching it? That's what that was getting at. <laughs> Rather than disturb my slumbering valet, I placed it so that so as to throw its rays more fully upon the book. Okay. Uh, but the action produced an effect altogether unanticipated. The rays of the numerous candles, for there were many, now fell within the, a niche of the room which had hitherto been thrown into deep shade by one of the bedposts. I, well, what was that? <laughs> Sound of candles um, going out. Ah, okay. I thus saw a vivid light of a picture all unnoticed before. It was the portrait of a young girl just, ri <laughs> just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at the painting hurriedly and then closed my eyes. Why I did this was not at first apparent even to my own perception, but while my lids remained thus shut, I ran over in mind my reason for so shutting them. He didn't know why he shut his eyes, and he started thinking about, why did I just shut my eyes? <laughs> hmm. Quite a ludicrous sentence, if you will. Okay. <laughs> it was an impulsive movement to gain time for thought, to make sure that my vision had not deceived me, to calm and subdue my fancy for a more sober and more certain gaze. In a very, f in a very few moments, I again looked fixedly at the painting. That I, now, that, I, that I now saw aright, I could not and would not doubt, for the first flashing of the candles upon the canvas had seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses, and to startle me at once into waking life. The portrait, I have already said, was that of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders, done in what is technically termed a vignette manner, uh, much in the style of the favorite heads of Sully. The arms, mm -hmm. the bosom, and even the ends of the radiant hair melted imperceptibly into the vague yet deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. I don't <clears throat> want to do a melting sound. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Keep announcing the, the sound effects so we know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The frame was oval, richly gilded, and filigreed, filigreed in moresque. I have no idea what either of those words mean, by the way, so sorry. Moresque is in italic, so it must be important. Uh, 
As a thing of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself, but it could have been neither the execution of the work nor the immortal beauty of the countenance which had so suddenly and so vehemently moved me. Least of all could it have been that my fancy, shaken from its half slumber, had mistaken, had mistaken the head for that of a living person. Boing, boing, boing. <laughs> okay, what was that? <laughs> I don't know. Him getting the attention of the picture or something. Ah, okay. I saw at once that the peculiarities of the design of the vignetting... I did not realize that was a verb. Okay. Vignetting and of the frame must have instantly dispelled such idea. Must have prevented even its momentary entertainment. Thinking earnestly upon these points, I remained for an hour perhaps half sitting, half reclining, with my vision riveted upon the portrait. At length, satisfied with the true secret of its effects, I fell back within the bed. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I have found the spell of the picture in the absolute lifelikeness of the expression. It was, the, it was in italic, so I was having a hard time making out the words lifelike and likeness, likeliness. Life likeliness of expression, which at first startling, finally confounded, subdued, and appalled me with the deep and reverent awe, I replaced the candelabrum in its former position. The cause of my deep agitation being thus shut from view, I sought eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories. Turning to the number which designated the oval portrait, I, I there read the vague and quaint words which follow. So, it's a book within a book, or a sto mm -hmm. story within a story. Okay. Whoa. Yeah. I insert your own Inception joke there. I won't do it. Okay. <laughs> so insert you... my what? Inception. You know, that movie. Oh, Inception. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell were you thinking of? <laughs> oh, I was just doing a fake dirty joke. Let's just keep moving. Let's keep on moving. Okay. She was a maiden of the rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee. <clears throat> <laughs> and evil was the hour when she saw and loved and wedded the painter. <laughs> <laughs> he, passionate, studious, austere, and having already a bride in his art, she, a maiden of the rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee, all light and smiles, and frolicsome as the young fawn. I don't know what kind of a sound a fawn makes. I'm, I'm trying to think of what a deer makes. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of like one of those indescribable forest sounds, like a. <laughs> no, that's more. <laughs> yeah, that's a horse. <laughs> a freaking <laughs> horse with <laughs> a freaking horse horse with horns. Okay, loving and cherishing. A horny horse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Loving and cherishing, cherish, cherishing, wow, that's a hard word to say. All things hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette and brushes and other untoward instruments which deprived her of the countenance boom, 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 boom. <laughs> of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride. But she was humble and obedient, and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark high turret chamber, where the light tripped upon the pale canvas, only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from hour to hour and from day to day, and he was passionate and wild and a moody man, <clears throat> who became lost in reveries, so that he would not see that the light which fell so ghastly in that lone turret withered the health and the spirits, uh, spirits of his bride, who pined visibly to all but him. Yet she smiled on and still on, uncompa uncomplainingly, <clears throat> because she saw that the painter, who had high renown, took a fervid and burning pleasure in this task and wrought day and night to depict her, who so loved him, yet who grew daily more dispirited and weak. And in sooth some who beheld the portrait spoke of its re resemblance in low words, as of, <clears throat> as of a mighty marvel, and a proof not less of the power of the painter than of his deep love for her whom he depicted so surpassingly well. But at length, as the labor drew nearer to its conclusion, there were admitted none into the turret, for the painter had grown wild with the ardor of his work, and turned his eyes from the canvas rarely even to regard the countenance of his wife. 
and he would not see the tints which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her of her who sat beside him <laughs> yeah it's starting to get get quite morbid here and when many weeks had passed and but little remained to do save one brush upon the mouth and one tint upon the eye the spirit of the lady again flickered up as the flame within the socket of the lamp and then the brush was given and then the tint was placed and for one moment the painter stood entranced before the work which he had wrought but in the next while he yet gazed he grew tremulous and very pallid and aghast and cr <clears throat> and crying with loud voice <laughs> why uh, well actually that was leading up to a line here <laughs> This, this is indeed life itself turned suddenly to regard his beloved she was dead and that's the end of the story <laughs> yeah so his wife died sorry coming yeah sorry coming but it's still creepy it is it is and that's quite an intense ending too yeah it is like starts with the guy just reading a book uh and looking at a painting and yeah but yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a very classic. I didn't actually think about this, that we have two stories with kind of like a tragic uh, female character at the center of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, first of all, how did you feel about that story before we move on to the next one? Oh, I can see why that guy couldn't sleep in the story. <laughs> yes, very, very lifelike. I mean, uh, I guess there is like an implication that, you know, her, that the wife wife's life was kind of drained away, or you could just read it more literally that uh, she starved to death, basically sitting sitting uh, posing for this picture. I was I was reading it, sitting there smiling without complaint, there and there for months on end. I was thinking she she was already dead by the time she was being painted, and she was slowly rotting away while oh, yeah. he was painting. Yeah, yeah, that that definitely you 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 can see it that way as well. It's it's very good. It's very good. Very okay. creepy, especially when you say the betrayal. Which probably means after the wedding she got murdered, and um, yeah, it's, it's quite quite thought provoking actually, but just a simple um, story. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, we still have the other story that I wanted to get to. This is uh, so. This is Berenice, and uh, this is something that I really, really advocate for. I, I have a blog on my. Uh, I mean, I have a post on my blog, which is my top ten favorite Edgar Allan Poe stories, and Berenice. Uh, is the is is my personal favorite of all the tragic uh sto the stories about tragic female characters because i don't know if you knew this but of course poe um got married very young as people did back in those days uh and mm -hmm. his wife uh and sadly died i think possibly from tuberculosis because everybody freaking died of tuberculosis back then uh so that's why he wrote so many stories about like tragic female characters uh so because it was kind of very uh you know, because because he had like real life experience with that. But I have to say, like most of those stories, uh, now that oval portrait, I didn't really think about it, but that was actually a really good one. But most of them are kind of just kind of sad and not very exciting. There's one in this like printed collection called Ligeia, which is really the guy, really a guy just uh, seeing his dead girlfriend uh, haunting him. But it's it's kind of like a it's kind of a slow story. There's not a whole lot to it, and. The Fall of the House of Usher is also uh, kind of like that. Which, by the way, yes, yeah, sorry, uh, that's that's another time we t discussed that in the previous podcast, and I did check it. There is a Vincent Price movie called The House of Usher. Yes, remember yep, that. Not to be, I say, not to be confused with the uh, the artist Usher. Uh, what? <laughs> Don't you remember the musician named Usher? Usher. Yeah, I know him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you he were talking. Had, about, he know, hasn't he, had a hit in years, so. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I was just saying, like, I, I, I checked on that because you, you thought that was a very exciting thing to sit, to see, and yeah, it was. It, there is, a, there is a House of Usher movie with Vincent Price, um, and I even didn't even think about this, but it was actually directed by Roger Corman. So, Ooh, that's a holy trinity right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I forgot, like, yeah, that's Corman did all those uh, Poe movies at one point. Like, not all of them were very faithful, but that one is uh, supposedly very faithful to the original story. So, yeah, you, you might want to, like, think about checking that out. Um, I'm guessing it, I guess it also means that that movie would have nudity in it if it's a Corman movie. Well, yeah, there's a kind of a creepy undertone, which isn't, I think, isn't really from the original story. Um, but I, I won't spoil it. I, I'll let you check it out if you want okay. to check it out. Okay, but um, 
But Berenice, uh, like this one, I think is hands down the best one because not only because it has by far the most tragic of the tragic heroines in my opinion, but because the finale is so fucking creepy in this one. Uh, and this is another, like, like I said, this is, the, this is a story I read for class back in high school. Um, but then, it, but the th thing, I really was uh, annoyed uh, that it wasn't in this uh, collection that I have. And okay, when I said that name incorrectly several times as Benaris uh, in the previous podcast, that's not, that, that, that is not the first time that has happened. Uh, and it's not the first time that I've confused the story because this time I'm reading this from the computer because I don't have it on the, uh, uh, in the collection. And so, by the way, just reminding everybody, all the Edgar Allan Poe stories are public domain. There's plenty of websites you can just go. And that's what I actually did. I found one of those, uh, websites hosting this story and I copied it for myself, uh, because I knew we wanted to read it for this podcast. Uh, but... I had so much trouble finding this because even when looking on Wikipedia, I kept misspelling the name as Benaris. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I had to look up the list because Wikipedia luckily has a list of all the stories. And then I found it and I realized, oh, cry, uh, crud. Like, and, you know, it was funny. Then I went and I looked for this and I copied it and I saved it as a PDF on my computer. Um, but then after that first podcast and I realized, wait a minute, am I saying the name of the story wrong again? Like Benaris Benary, and not Berenice, which is the real. And then I went to Wikipedia again, checked it. Yep, I said it wrong. Well, surely I didn't title the PDF wrong. And then I looked at the PDF and I had spelled it Benaris. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story. And please forgive me. I am not, you know, American or uh, I'm brought from an English I did not know the name of this story for a very long time. I knew I read it because I remember it so vividly, but I forgot the name of the story. So this is one that I had been looking for for a long time as well. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So that was not intentional uh, fuck up. And uh, But are you now, Kaiser, ready for our second story, Berenice? Yep, and I'm going to try to refrain from doing any um, bear sounds. <laughs> okay. <Rawr>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let, let's let's begin. Misery is manifold. The wretchedness of Earth is multiform, overreaching the wide horizon like the rainbow. Its hues are as various as the hues of that arch, as distinct too, yet as intimately blended, overreaching the wide horizon like the rainbow. How is it that from beauty I have derived a type of unloveliness? <clears throat> Sorry, I read that really badly because there's a question mark. <laughs> From the covenant of peace, a simile of sorrow, uh, but thus is it. But thus is it. Okay, sorry, I don't know how to read that properly. And as in ethics, evil is a consequence of good. So, in fact, out of joy is sorrow born. Either the memory of past bliss is the anguish of today. Or, to, or the agonies which are, have their origins and ecstasies which might have been. I have a tale to tell, in, in its own essence rife with horror. I would suppress it, were it not for the record, uh, more of feeling than of facts. I understand where she's gone. I've had hangovers too, and they hurt. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, some post stories have like really, really flowery beginnings like this one. <clears throat> okay. My baptismal name is Aegis. Uh, this is really well. Ha Aegis is spelled with like uh, E G A E O. Uh, sorry, no. Aegis. Yeah, E G A E U S. But it's like the A and E sm smushed together. So I'm not entirely sure how you're supposed to pronounce Agus. this. Aegis. Aegis. No, that Agus? doesn't. Sound, that doesn't sound correct. I'm gonna keep calling him Aegis. I mean, he's telling the story, so they're probably not going to say his name too many times. <laughs> okay. That of my family I will not mention, yet there are no towers in the land of more time honored than my gloomy gray her hereditary halls. <clears throat> I don't know any sound effects for halls, sorry. Yeah, no, but I, I, <laughs> I was about to say, like, <laughs> that, that, uh, ah, oh, crack, crack, I forgot what it's called when, it ha when the words begin with the same letter, uh, the same sounds. Alliteration, yeah, that, that sick alliteration, man. Hered, hereditary halls. Like, her, hereditary is a hard word to say anyway. And then you have to put alliteration there. Like, goddammit. Okay, our line has been called a race of visionaries. <clears throat> 
and in many striking particulars in the character of the family mansion, in the frescoes of the chief saloon, in the tapestries of the dormitories, in the chiseling of some buttresses in the armory. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that little giggle. <laughs> Buttress is a wonderful <laughs> word, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. But more especially in the gallery of antique paintings, in the fashion of the library chamber, and lastly, in the very peculiar nature of the library's contents, there is more than sufficient evidence to warrant the belief. The recollections of my earliest years are connected with that chamber and with its volumes, of which latter I will say no more. Here died my mother, herein I, was I born. But it is merely idleness to say that I had not lived before, that the soul has no previous existence. You deny it, let us not argue the matter. Convince myself, I seek not to convince. There is, however, a remembrance of aerial forms. Yeah, they keep using that weird, like, smoosh together A and E a lot. So I do think it's Aegis, uh, his name, because uh, they, they spelled Ariel like that as well. Uh, <clears throat> of spiritual and meaning, yes. Of sounds musical yet sad. A remembrance. <laughs> a remembrance. Uh, oh, God damn it. Remembrance. That's a hard word. A remembrance which will not be excluded. A memory like a shadow. Vague. Variable. Indefinite. Unsteady. God damn this bucket list of ad adjectives. <laughs> 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 and like a shadow, too, in the impossibility of my getting rid of it while the sunlight of my reason shall exist. <clears throat> in that chamber I was born, thus awakening, as it were, from a long night of what seemed, but was not, non-entity at once into the very regions of fairyland. <laughs> <laughs> Spooky ghosts and laughing fairies into a palace yeah. of imagination, into the wild dominions of monastic thought and er erudition. Erudition. Okay. It is not singular that I gazed around me with a startled and ardent eye, that I loitered away my boyhood in books and dissipated my youth in reverie, but it is singular that as years rolled away, and the noon of manhood found me still in the mansion of my fathers. It is wonderful what stagnation there fell upon the springs of my life. Wonderful how... Hey, you! <laughs> Stag was that the stagnation? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wonderful how... Uh, Total an inversion took place in the character of my common thoughts. The realities of the world affected me as visions, and as visions only, while the wild ideas of the land of dreams became, in turn, not the material of my everyday existence, but in very deed, the existence utterly and solely, solely in itself. Okay. This is this is like one of those stories that has a very kind of uh, exposition heavy opening like we are we're not really into the meat of the story yet but now now we're actually getting into it uh okay Benares and I were cousins and we grew up together in my paternal <laughs> Okay what, what, what was that <laughs> Haven't you heard the 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 dueling banjo song uh, I know it. I don't. I don't know it by heart. So sorry. Okay. I'll look it up after the show. And um, yeah, yeah. I, I. I know. I know what it. What it's from. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yet differently we grew. I ill of health and buried in gloom. She agile, graceful, and overflowing with energy. Boing. Woohoo! Flip, 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 flip. Running, 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 running. <laughs> Hers the ramble of the hillside. Uh, mine the studies of the cloister. Cloister! Cloister! The yeah. Pokemon. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, living, <laughs> I living within my own heart and addicted body and soul to the most intense and painful meditation. Whap! Mm -hmm. Ouch! <laughs> painful meditation. <laughs> she roaming... I know I shouldn't have pa I know I shouldn't have paid for that chiropractic. She roaming carelessly through life with no thought of the shadows in her path or the silent flight <laughs> of the raven-winged hours. Ah, ah. Berenice, I call upon her name, Berenice, and from the grey ruins of memory a thousand tumultuous recollections are startled at the sound. <laughs> They're very quiet, tumultuous recollections. Mm. Ah, a vividly is her image before me now, uh, as in Surprise. the <laughs> as in the early days of her light heartedness and joy. <laughs> 
Oh, gorgeous yet fantastic beauty. Oh, sylph amid the shrubberies of Arnheim. Oh, Arnheim. Ne- Arnheim. Arnheim. I, 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 I guess it's it, it's 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 uh, one of the Nordic uh, uh, other worlds or something. <clears throat> I mean, if if, so, if some woman said I look like Arnheim, then that would sound like a big insult. Okay. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I don't. I don't know what. What what Arnheim you're talking about? I don't know, but I don't know, but it sounds insulting. Yeah, no. Oh, sorry, I'm getting mixed up with cowhide. W- wow. Okay. Moving on. <clears throat> oh, Nayed among her fountains, and then then all is mystery and terror, and a tale which should not be told. Disease. <clears throat> disease. A fatal disease fell like the simoom upon the frame, and even while I gazed upon her, the spirit of change swept over her, pervading her mind, her habits, her character, and in a manner the most subtle and terrible, disturbing even the very identity of her person. Alas, the destroyer came and went, and the victim, where was she? Where was she? Hello. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I, I read that inc- badly again. Oh, uh, yeah. I was just trying to be Grim Reaper there. Hello. <laughs> Hello, I'm the Grim Reaper. Mm. Why do I sound like Mr. B? <laughs> I knew her not, or knew her no longer as Berenice. Okay, uh, here we go. Among the numerous train of maladies, super in. Uh, superinduced by the fatal and primary one which af- effected as a revolution of so horrible a kind of. Uh, a, 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 Wow, this is, a, this is a tricky sentence. Of so horrible a kind in the moral and physical being of my cousin may be mentioned as the most distressing and obstinate in its nature, a species of epilepsy not unfrequently terminating in trance itself. Trance very nearly resembling positive dissolution and from which her manner of recovery was, in most instances, startlingly ar- abrupt. In the meantime... Okay, now- Yes, hurry. Now it just sounds like now it just sounds like she died at a disco rave. <laughs> okay, <laughs> she's not dead yet. Uh, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> In the meantime, my own disease, for I have been told that I should call it by no other appellation, my own disease then grew rapidly upon me and aggravated in its symptoms by the I- immo- immoderate use of opium. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Assumed, finally, a monomaniac character of a novel and extraordinary form, hourly and momentarily gaining vigor and at length obtaining over me the most singular and incomprehensible ascendancy. This monomania, if I must so term it, consisted of a morbid uh, irritability of the nerves immediately affecting those properties of the mind in metaphysical science termed the attentive. Uh, it is more than probable that I am not understood. Uh, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but I fear that it is indeed in no manner possible to convey to the mind of the merely general reader an adequate idea of the nervous intensity of interest with which, in my, in my case, the powers of me- meditation, not to speak technically, busied and, as it were, buried themselves in the contemplation of even the most common objects in the of the universe. So he's having these fits where he gets like super focused into things. That's what he's saying. Th- that intensity of interest was in italics. <clears throat> to muse for long unwearied hours with my attention riveted to some frivolous device upon the margin or in the topography of a book. To become absorbed for the better part of a summer's day in a quaint shadow falling aslant upon the tapestry or upon the floor. To lose myself for an entire night in watching the steady flame of lamp or the embers of fire. To dream away whole days over the perfume of flowers. To repeat monotonously some common word until the sound by dint of frequent repetition ceased to convey any idea whatever to the mind. To lose all sense uh, of motion or physical existence in a stale of Whoa. absolute bodily qu- quiescence. I don't know how to say that. Quiescence, long and obstinately perse- persevered in. Persevered in. That was a long sentence. <laughs> mm. Opium's a hell of a drug, man. <laughs> 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 Such were a few of the most common and least pernicious vagaries 
induced by a condition of the mental faculties, not indeed altogether unparalleled, unparalleled but certainly bidding defiance to anything like oh. analysis or explanation. So I think the idea is, though, that he has this mania going on and the opium is just making it worse. <clears throat> Sounds like he's high. Yeah, yeah. Yet let me not be misapprehended. The undue, intense, and morbid attention thus excited by objects in their own na nature frivolous must not be confounded in character with that ruminating propensity common to all mankind and more especially indulged in my in by person of ardent imagination by no means it was not even as might be at first supposed an extreme condition or uh, exaggeration of such propensity but primarily and essentially distinct and different in the one instance the dreamer or enthusiast being interested by an object usually not frivolous, imperceptibly loses sight of this object in a wilderness of deductions and suggestions issuing therefrom, until, at the conclusion of a daydream often replete with luxury, he finds incitimentum. <laughs> oh, sorry. That, that, that's a difficult one. Incitimentum. I think that's Latin, Latin. Or, first cause of his musings utterly vanished and forgotten. Dude, what was I on about anyway? <laughs> okay, I... I don't know. This is quite a this is quite a talky story. This one. Yeah, yeah, and he's and he's high <laughs> as well. <laughs> In my case, the primary yeah. object was invariably frivolous. Although assuming through the medium of my distempered vision and refracted and unreal importance, few deductions, if any, were made, and those few pertinent pertinaciously returning in, so to speak, upon the original object as a center. The meditations were never pleasurable, and at the termination of the reverie, the first cause, so far from being out of sight, had attained that supernaturally exaggerated interest which was the prevailing feature of the disease. In a word, the Ooh. powers of mine more particularly exercised were with me, as I have said before, the attentive, and are with the daydreamer, the speculative. So this guy's having some bad trips, is basically. <laughs> I've noticed that. Yeah. It's like, you need to calm down, man. You need to kind of, quick, eat this cracker. Yeah. <laughs> My books at this epoch, if they did not actually serve to irritate the disorder, partook. It will be perceived largely in their, in their imaginative and inconsequential nature of the characteristic qualities of the disorder itself. I well remember, among others, the, tr the treaties of the noble Italian uh, Calius, Secundus Curio, the Amplitude Beati Regni Dei, the Saint Aug... Austin's great work of the City of God, and Tertullian, De Carne Christi, <clears throat> in which the unintelligible sentence, Mortus est de filius, credible est quae ineptum est, et sepultum resurrexit, certum est qui impossibili est, occur occupied my undivided time for many weeks of laborious and fruitless investigation, and my apologies for my terrible Latin pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if if that, any of that made any sense to you. No, um, I'm, I'm no, I'm pretty sure I need the Google Translate for that. Yeah, we for the for the Latin. Yeah, we we, 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 could, like... we could check that at the end of the part of the podcast okay. if, uh, you, if you if you remember to remind me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thus it will appear that, shaken from its balance only by trivial things, my reasons bore resemblance to that ocean crag spoken by the <laughs> Ptolemy Heps, Hephaestion. Sorry, yeah, Hephaestion which, uh, steadily resisting the attacks of human violence and the fiercer fury of the waters oh, yeah. and winds, <laughs> trembled only the, to the touch of the flower called Afo, as, Asphodel. Asphodel? Is that that's how you say it? I don't know flowers. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know flowers, sorry. And although to, the, to a careless thinker, it might appear a matter beyond doubt that the fearful alteration produced by her unhappy malady in the moral condition of Berenice would afford me many objects of, for the exercise of that intense and morbid meditation whose nature I had been at some trouble in explaining, yet such was not by any means the case. Also, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm making this reading a little too dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> don't know if it's you or it's Poe. Yeah. In the lucid intervals of my infirmity, uh, her calamity indeed gave me pain, and taking deeply to heart that total... <laughs> 
taking deeply to her heart that total wreck of her fair and gentle life. Uh, I did not fail to ponder frequently and bitterly upon the wonder-working means by which so strange a revolution had been so suddenly brought to pass. By these reflections partook not of the idiosyncrasy of my disease, and were such as would have occurred under similar circumstances to the ordinary mass of mankind. True to its own character, my disorder re reveled in the less important but more startling changes wrought in the physical frame of Benares, and in the singular and most appalling distortion of her personal identity. <clears throat> All right, so now we're getting more into what's what's bugging Benares. Uh, Berenice, yeah, I, fuck it. I fucked it up again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. During the brightest days of her unparalleled beauty, most surely I had never loved her. In the strange anomaly of my existence, feelings with me had, been, had never been of the heart, and my passions always were of the mind. Through the gray of the early morning among the trellised, trellised? Yeah, trellised shadows of the forest at noonday. And in the silence of my library at night, she had flitted by my eyes, and I had seen her, not as <laughs> not as living and breathing Berenice, but as but as the Berenice of a dream. <laughs> not as a being of earth, earthly, but as the abstraction of such being, not as a thing to admire, but to analyze, not as an object of love, but as the theme of the most abstract. Uh, abstruse, although desultory spec speculation. Yeah, I should probably mention that Poe is sometimes a lot easier to read in your head than out loud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I've noticed that. <laughs> and now, now I shuddered in her presence, the gr <laughs> and grew pale at her approach, yet bitterly lamenting her fallen and desolate condition. I knew that she had loved me long, and in an evil moment I spoke to her of marriage. So yeah, by the way, so <laughs> Poe was also married to his cousin, yeah. I know that. Yeah. I remember. I, that's one of the facts I've known about him. Yeah. And wasn't the other big fact was he died drowning in a water fountain or something like that? Uh, yeah, he was found. Yeah, he was found in a gutter. Yeah, he had a he had a pretty miserable <coughs> later years. Yeah. Because yeah, that's what I was, that's what I was thinking of listening to this. Is this like a biography of himself? It it definitely like has some autobiographical elements of it. Like, I don't know. Yeah, this, this is this is this is that's why I think a lot a lot of Poe stories have like these tragic female characters as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And at length the period of our nuptials was approaching, when upon an afternoon in the winter of the year, one of those unseasonably warm, calm, and misty days, which are the nurse of the beautiful Halcyon, I sat and sat, as I thought alone, uh, in the inner apartment of the library. Uh, but uplifting mm -hmm. my eyes, Berenice stood before me. Hello. <laughs> I'm, I'm loving Berenice's womanly wo voice. <laughs> Was it my own excited imagination, or the mystery influence of the atmosphere, or the opium? <laughs> I added that last part. Or the uncertain twilight of the chamber, or the great draperies which fell around her figure, or the opium? <laughs> no. Okay, sorry. I'm, I'm uh, trying, trying so, too hard so, with that so, joke. So yeah, sorry. Ah, uh, so, so Bernice had great draperies, huh? Ooh. <laughs> I, just, I just took a sip of water when you said that. <laughs> okay. That caused it to loom up in so unnatural a degree. Her loomeries. <laughs> or what, what did you say? Draperies? No. Draperies. Yeah. <laughs> I could not tell. <laughs> because of the opium. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> Perhaps she had grown taller since her melody. <laughs> uh, oh, God. <laughs> well, that would be a weird disease. Uh, uh, no, okay, let's not talk about that. I know oh, Mario has that one. Oh, boy. She spoke, however, no word. And I, not for worlds, could, have, uh, I, uh, could I have uttered a syllable. An icy chill ran through my frame. A sense of insufferable Ugh. anxiety oppressed me. A consuming curiosity pervaded my soul. And sinking back upon the chair, I remained for some time breathless and motionless. And with my eyes riveted uh, upon her person, alas, it's emanci em emaciation. Is that how you spell it? Emaciation. Uh, I don't know, but it sounds like he's getting high on opium again. 
I, I, it says emaciation. I'm, I think it's emaciation, but okay, what? It's emaciation was excessive and not one vestige of the former being lurked in any single line of the contour by burning glances at length fell upon her face. The forehead was high and very pale and singularly placid, and the one's golden hair fell partially over it, and <clears throat> the overshadowed and overshadowed the hollow temples uh, with, ri with ringlets, now black as the raven's ring. And jarring... Ah, weird. Okay, it, it, this version has these weird, like, uh, references here that these might be changed. Like, it says that it's possible. the line has possibly also been raven's wing, which would actually make more sense to me. Okay. Uh, I, was, I was thinking of the raven's eye. Yeah. Uh, well, it's talking about she has rings around her eyes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, she sounds sick. Yeah, 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 exactly. And jarring discordantly in their fantastic character with the reigning melancholy of the countenance, the eyes were lifeless and lusterless, and I shrunk involuntarily from their glassy stare to the contemplation of the thin and shrunken lips. <laughs> yeah, a lot of men have that problem. <laughs> Shrinking un involuntarily. <laughs> They... It's it's okay. It happens to every man eventually. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, I got a really bad joke in my mind about that. Yeah. As she, as she tried wearing a paper bag. But I'm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. Let let's keep reading. They parted, and in a smile of peculiar meaning, the teeth of of the changed Berenice disclosed themselves slowly to my view. Would to God that I had never beheld them, or that, having done so, I had died. <clears throat> okay. The shutting of a door disturbed me, and looking up, ah! I found my cousin had departed from the chamber, but from <laughs> disordered chamber uh, of my brain had not, alas, departed, and would not be driven away the white and ghastly spectrum of the teeth. Not a speck upon their surface, not a shade on their enamel, not a line in their configuration, not an indenture in their edges. <clears throat> but what that period of her smile had suffered sufficed to, to brand in my, in, in, upon my memory. I saw them now even more unequivocally uh, than I beheld them then. The teeth, the teeth, they were there and there and everywhere, and visibly and palpably before me, long, narrow, and excessively white, with the pale lips writhing about them as in the very m moment of their first terrible development. Colgate. It's <laughs> 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 uh, just singing about, like, toothpaste for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Then came the full fury of the monomania, and I struggled in vain against its strange and irresistible influence. In the multiplied objects in the external world, I had no thoughts but for the teeth. All other matters and all different interests became absorbed in their single contemplation. They, they alone were present to the mental eye, and they, in their sole individuality, became the essence of my mental life. I held them in every light, I turned them in every attitude, I surveyed their characteristics, I dwelled upon their peculiarities, I pondered upon their confor confirmation, I mused upon... And I put them under my pillow, waiting for the tooth fairy. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm tish. Okay, good. I mused upon the alternation of their nature, and shuddered as I assigned to them in imagination a sensitive and sentient power, and even when unassisted by the lips, a capability of moral expression of mad sal, it has been said, quo, ah, God, this must be French, que tu se, se pas et tu en, uh, de sentiment, uh, and of better, uh, and of Berenice, I, that, that... I more seriously believe, que, Que tu seten etan des idee. <laughs> more for the more fodder for the Google Translate. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been that would have been great if it says. And then he said, "Oh God, not more French." <laughs> 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 All right. Okay, but uh, let me continue. And the evening closed in upon me thus, and then the darkness came and tarried and went, and the day again dawned, and the mists of a second night were now gathering around, and still I sat motionless in that solitary room, and still sat buried in medit 
buried in meditation and still the phantasma of the teeth maintained in it its terrible ascendancy as with the most vivid and hideous distinctness it floated about amid the changing lights and shadows of the chamber yeah the guy stood there two days waiting thinking about the teeth <laughs> yeah at length there broke forcibly in upon my dreams a wild cry as of horror and dismay and thereunto after a pause succeeded the sound of troubled voices intermingled with many low moanings of sorrow or <laughs> <laughs> or of pain i arouse hurriedly oh. I arose hurriedly from my seat, and throwing open one of the doors of the library, there stood out in the antechamber a servant maiden, all in tears. I... <laughs> all in tears. <laughs> <laughs> and she told me that Berenice was no more. Seized with the epileptic fit, she had fallen dead in the early morning, and now at the closing <gasps> in of the night, the grave was ready for its tenant and all the preparations for the burial were completed. Yeah, so she did go down <clears throat> the way you suggested earlier. <laughs> okay. With a heart full of grief, yet reluctantly and oppressed with awe, I made my way to the bedchamber of the departed. The room was large and very dark, and at every step uh, within its gloomy precincts... Precincts? Precincts? Ah, that's, that's difficult to read. I encountered the paraphernalia of the grave the coffin so a menial told me <coughs> <laughs> great timing <laughs> that was that was the purpose that was the yeah. coffin sound effect lay surrounded by the curtains of yonder bed of yonder bed wow <laughs> i love that the curtains of yonder bed okay in that, that sounds like it could be a, a name of a story on its own we now we now read the curtains of yonder bed. Yeah. In that coffin, he whisperingly assured me was all that remained of Berenice, who was, it asked me, uh, what was that? <laughs> that's all of her. We're going to find the rest of her. That's all what you get. Oh, okay. <laughs> who, hmm, who was it asked me would not look upon the corpse? I had seen the lips of no one move, yet the question had been demanded, and the echo of the syllable still lingered in the room. It was impossible to refuse, and with a sense of suffocation I dragged myself to the side of the bed. Gently I uplifted the sable draperies of the curtains. Not her draperies, luckily. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the sound effect was going to make them was ooh. <laughs> <laughs> As I let them fall, they descended upon the shoulders and shutting me thus out of the living. Okay, I gotta get that picture out of my mind now. Okay, <laughs> closed me the strict, strictest communion with the deceased. The very atmosphere was redolent of death. The peculiar smell of the coffin sickened me. Ugh. And I fancied a, de a deletrous, deletrous? Deletrous odor was already exhaling from the body. I would have given words to escape, to fly from the pernicious influence of mortality, to breathe once again the pure air of the external heavens, but I had no longer the power to move. Yeah, but I had no longer the power to move. My knees tottered beneath me, and I remained rooted to the spot. Oh, Help, I'm stuck. <laughs> and gazing upon the frightful length of the rigid body as it lay outstretched in the dark coffin without a lid. God of heaven, is it possible? Uh, is it my brain that reels? Uh, or was it indeed the fingers, the finger of the enshrouded, yeah, sorry, yeah, enshrouded dead that stirred in the white cerement that bound it, frozen with unutterable awe? I slowly raised my eyes to the countenance of the corpse. There had been a band around the jaws, but I would not, I, I know not how it was broken asunder. The livid lips were wreathed into the species of smile, and <clears throat> through the enveloping gloom, once again there glared upon me in too palpable reality the white and glistening and ghastly teeth of Berenice. I sprang, I sprang, <clears throat> sorry, I, I sprang convulsively, convulsively from the bed and uttering no word rushed, rushed forth a maniac a maniac sorry <laughs> rushed forth a maniac from the apartment of triple horror <laughs> and mis <laughs> of triple horror and mystery and death all right and now uh from the uh we're finally getting to the final few uh paragraphs of the story so now co now comes in that uh that uh <laughs> 
that finale that I was talking up so much at the beginning. I'm not sure how much how exciting it is after all the opium stuff that we've talked about and <laughs> the draperies. Opiums, the draperies. <laughs> yeah. All right. But let's 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 get into it. I found myself again sitting in the library and again sitting there alone. It seemed that I had newly awakened from a confused and exciting dream. I knew that it was now midnight, and I was well aware that since the setting of the sun, Berenice had been interred. But of the dreary period which had intervened, I, I had no positive, at least no definite comprehension. Yet its memory was rife with horror. Horror more horrible from being vague, and the terror more terrible from ambiguity. It was fearful page in the record of my existence, written all over with dim and hideous and unintelligible recollections. I strived, my, I strived to decipher them, but in vain, while ever and anon, like the spirit of a departed sound, the shrill and piercing shriek of a female voice seemed to be ringing in my ears. <laughs> I had done a deed. What was it? And the echoes of the chamber answered me. What was it? 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 All right. Was it? Yep. In the table beside me burned a lamp, and near it lay a little box of ebony. It was a, a box of no remarkable character, and I had seen it frequently before, it being the property of the family physician. <clears throat> but how came it? But how came it there upon my table? And why did I shudder in regarding it? These things were in no manner to be accounted for, and my eyes at length dropped to the open pages of a book, and to, uh, to a sentence underscored therein. I think that's an old way of saying underlining, actually. Mm -hmm. The words were the singular but simple words of the poet M. Zayat. Disabant mihi solides si sepulcrum amicae visit arum, curas meas aliquentulum fore le levitas. Morinus Latinus. <laughs> why then? Inchne on a Latine. Yeah, yeah. Why then had I read more Latin? No. Why then, as I perused them, did the hairs of, of my head erect themselves on end? Doing, 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 doing. <laughs> and the blood of my body congeal within my veins. <sniffs> Thank you. There came a light tap on the library door. Ah, that more like knocking. Yeah, that's good. And pale as the tenant of a tomb, a menial and a menial entered upon tiptoe. Dun 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 dun. His looks were wild with terror. <laughs> <laughs> terror, not amusement. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Okay. And he <laughs> Okay. And he spoke to me in a voice tremulous, husky, and very low. What woof, said woof. <laughs> <laughs> what said he? Some broken sentences I heard. He told of a wild cry heard in the silence of the night. <laughs> of the gathering together of the household. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> I love that hello. Of a surge in the direction of the sound. <laughs> and then his tone grew thrillingly distinct as he whimpered me of a violated grave of a disfigured body discovered upon its margin, a body enshrouded, yet still breathing, still palpitating, still alive. Ugh. He pointed to my garments. They were muddy and clotted with gore. I spoke not, and he took me gently by the hand, but it was intended with the, imp with the impress of human nails. Uh, what? But it was indented with the impress of human nails. Oh, 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 yeah, his hand. Yeah. Okay. He directed my attention to some object against the wall. I looked at it for some minutes. It was a spade. With a shriek, I bounded to the table. It gasped and grasped the ebony box that lay upon it, but I could not force it open, and in my tremor, it slipped from my, out of my hands and fell heavily. Whoops. It fell heavily and burst into pieces, and from it... <laughs> With the rattling sound there rolled out some instruments of dental surgery intermingled with many white and glistening substances that were scattered to and fro about the floor. <laughs> and that's the end of the story. Ugh. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Kids, say no to drugs. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd forgotten about the opium in the story, but yeah, that's, that's, 
that's a good that's a good message to send. Yeah, don't you know? Stay stay away from drugs. You might you might open you know open your former fiance's grave and uh, <laughs> and steal their teeth. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that was yeah, that was from something. the sounds of from the sounds of the story. It sounds like he likes to black out a lot through um his opium addiction. Yeah, or that, that was the kind of the mania. Okay, hey, let's you let, let's take a look at what those uh what those um Latin phrases meant <laughs> because uh we we did, we weren't okay. able to figure them out. I, I'm looking at Google Translate right now uh, because that because I forgot about it. Like that's a, that's a weird thing. You will you will occasionally find in uh. In in uh, in post stories uh, that they just have like randomly um, the, these um, the, these Latin and also French phrases because uh, I guess Poe Poe was just very literate with other languages as well. I mean I, that's the thing like Poe had a big problem with his uh, stories not being like commercially very successful, but he was a huge star in France. So. Uh, if he had gone to France, he would have probably like gotten a slightly better deal on the, you know, makes, the story. Makes sense. He's got he's quite got quite a pardon the pun a poetic way of um speaking. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, and also, and also, uh, well yeah, he, he seemed to have a fondness of the French anyway because R Murders in the Rue Morgue, uh, for instance, takes place. Well, all the Dupont stories take place in Paris actually. Uh, but yeah, so the first phrase, which was the uh, mortus est dei filius, credible est quae ineptum est, et sepultum resurrexit certum est quae impossibile est. So something about resurrections. It's, uh, so the translator says, he died of his son, credible because of it, it is insignificant and buried and rose because it is impossible to. Okay, that's creepy. <laughs> and then the second, the other... Um, so that was the fr uh, then there was the French phrase. Where was the other? Oh, here it is. This is the, the under the one he had underlined in the st in the story. So disappoint me he solidus si sepulcrum imacai visit erem. And there was actually another one that was kind of a sidebar. Visitarem. Oh, I didn't know how to translate that, so I'll remove it. Curas meas uh, ali quantulum fore levatas. So uh, if they had uh, if they had members visit the graves are glad of my care harem okay harem it would be little uh, be a little truceless okay I think I think Google Translate failed us there what was the thing that mm. oh okay maybe huh I, I let I put back in the uh, the thing that it didn't translate but it says if they were members visit the graves are glad Aries. Uh, my care, it would be a uh, little truceless. Yeah, Google Translate is kind of weird like this, like depending on what the words are. And let me check Aries, care. Oh, that's why it says visitarem. So that's another word for arem. For, so it can mean care, but it can also mean Aries, apparently. So that's why it was there. Okay, interesting. The harem one sounded more interesting. It's like, bury <laughs> me with all my ladies. Yeah, no, I think that was just Google Translate messing up because it's... Uh, I'm not sure if that's like one sentence or two sentences. It, it, it's kind of sort of weirdly broken off uh, in this version that I copied from the internet. Okay, but what did you think of that la that second story? It sounds like you had a tough time reading it a little bit, and it, it's like it's not a bad story, but it's, it sounds like one of those ones where you sort of have to read it yourself to get a better picture. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I would mean, say it sounds like a harder one to read. Yeah. Now, I think because of that finale and because of that creepy uh, mania that the guy's going on, I think a, that's why I like this story. Uh, but I will say it it definitely, and I, I think you will agree, like it did take a long while for it to get going. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It's so, quite a chatty bastard, that guy. <laughs> well, a lot of the poke characters are. Uh, but this is like one where I think, uh, so So that's what I said in the la previous podcast as well. Like, I think... The most sto post stories, like if they have a weak point, it's usually the beginning or the ending. Um, uh, although most post stories do have kind of really good endings, but like th there is usually that first couple of paragraphs, first three to five paragraphs in some cases, like it's all kind of expositiony and maybe not like super interesting um, because he's kind of like just using it to set the mood. But then there are those exceptions, and I think we might have to read it at some point. Uh, you know, the my favorite Poe story, which I, I talked about last time, The Black Cat, which is a really long story, and there is a long buildup, but I think it actually works for that story's benefit. And it's also because, well, this, this guy is like some kind of... Um, 
th this guy was clearly like some kind of aristocracy and he had kind of like a flowery, uh, you know, like, like he was talking about at the very beginning of the story, like he was a kind of a bookish guy. So it was actually within mm -hmm. his character that he used that kind of flowery language and Ben Reese was kind of like the opposite. Like that's the thing. That's another thing I had kind of forgotten about this story is like how their characters are kind of like mirrors of each other or, or like mirror opposites of each other. And that also kind of makes it uh, e even extra. Like you know that like halfway through the story, you kind of start to feeling, get the feeling like, whoa, is this kind of like just Poe basically telling about his own like tragic marriage, how it ended. Uh, with with his wife. Oh, no, yeah. I, I doubt the um, grave digging and um, pulling out the teeth was part of it. Yeah, no. And there are other stories that do take inspiration for like Poe's real life events. Uh, uh, Hopfrog weirdly has is is a kind of an interesting one, and maybe we ought to do that at some point as well. Uh, it's more, but although it's it's more of a kind of it's almost kind of a silly story, uh, kind of morbidly silly, but you know. Uh, uh, we should, we should check that out sometime as well. But do you have any last comments about this uh, story? Or uh, have you said all you had to say? I have n nothing more to say. All right. so right. I'm, I'm done. Okay, good. I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that a lot, even though Ber 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 Berenice was quite, quite a... What, it took us quite <clears throat> a while to get through mm -hmm. it. But I really enjoyed reading that story. I really enjoyed reading the Oval Portrait. And again... Please leave in the comments uh, which Poe story do you want us to read next time? Do you want us to read Murders in the Rue Morgue or something else? Uh, and I hope uh, and I hope that we'll get to do, record the next podcast pretty soon. But until next time, on Honda the Honda Mackinnon, see you on the next one. And don't forget to enjoy the draperies. <laughs> bye bye.